Yes, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. I love seeing all the places scroll by. We've got folks uh, tuning in from all over the world. This is Insightful Leader Live. Today, we'll be hearing all about AI. I'm Jess Love, Editor-in-Chief of Kellogg Insight and host of our podcast, The Insightful Leader. Quick plug for next month. Uh, in April, we're gonna be hearing from Professor Braden King as he talks about the ever evolving relationship between companies and social activists. So he'll also touch on how to be an activist in your own organization. Before we dive into artificial intelligence, a little bit of housekeeping. We are soon going to be changing up the chat function. So you're no longer going to be able to send messages um, to all of the other attendees. Uh, instead, we're gonna reserve that chat chat box for tech questions and other issues that are gonna go right to us behind the scenes. For questions uh, for our professor today, please use the Q&A box. And I wanna encourage you to upvote if you see an existing question in the box that looks really tantalizing. If you are uh, using the current version of Zoom, you should also see the option to use closed captioning. So this is called live transcript. Finally, I cannot emphasize this enough, this event will be recorded Everyone who registers will get a link to a video of this presentation. So let's get started. Uh, today, we're gonna hear from Eric Anderson. Eric Anderson is a professor of marketing at Kellogg. His research has focused on analytics and innovation as well as retailing, pricing strategy, channel management. Professor Anderson is also the co-author of a new book written with Florian Zettelmeyer called Leading with AI and Analytics and He's director of a brand new MBA I program, an MBA program jointly offered by Kellogg and the McCormick School of Engineering. That program focuses on preparing leaders at the intersection of business and technology. Of course, today he's going to be talking all about AI, its possibilities and practical tips on getting started. So welcome Professor Anderson, I will turn things over to you. Terrific, thank you so much Jess and thanks for inviting me here to uh, this webinar today. Uh, you know, what's crazy is I didn't realize we had so many people joining from all over the world. That's incredibly cool. So excited that we've got so many people here to uh, share in our discussion for the next hour. Um, to get things started, maybe I'll just share a few slides with us that'll help guide our discussion uh, that you and I are going to have today. And so uh, what I wanted to tell everyone about today was sort of, you know, what are some of the opportunities that are out there today with AI? What are some of the challenges you face? And then how can you start overcoming them? And both from a personal perspective, so what can I do myself, but also, you know, what can happen inside my organization. Um, and that's a lot of what we've been working about on the last few years is trying to help people not only personally, but also help companies try and have more success with AI and analytics. To set the sort of stage for all this, one of the facts that I always like to point to is that, you know, a number of surveys have been done from different companies about what's the state of readiness of AI, what's happening with the success of companies launching AI initiatives. And what's been true for several years now is that the success rate has been relatively low, right? And we're gonna talk more about that today um, and what you can do about it. But to start with, I wanted to show you what sort of like, what are sort of all the cool things happening at Kellogg and Northwestern that we're doing with AI and analytics today. And so I just wanted to point to a few things. One is, um, Jess is very modest, but this ebook was largely pulled together by Jess and team from Insight. Uh, so thank you for doing this. Um, and the ebook brings together a number of different Kellogg faculty, tells you a little bit about the research and what they're working on and all sorts of things happening at Kellogg around AI. And I believe, you know, any of the participants today can get access to that ebook and we can give links to that so people can have access to that in the future. And that gives you sort of a broad lens about what's happening at Kellogg and AI. And then since I'm in the marketing area, I, ch I chose a couple of things I also wanted to share with you that come more specifically from my colleagues in marketing. So the book in the middle there is the AI Marketing Canvas. It came out in January of this year, and it's by Jim Lisinski, who is a faculty member uh, in the Kellogg Marketing Department. And it's going to tell you more about, you know, sort of how to apply AI specifically to, do, to the domain of marketing. And then the third book that's up there is Leading with AI and Analytics. It's co-authored by myself and my colleague, Florian Zettelmeyer. And that book is really targeted at business leaders, right? So it's really focused in on trying to uh, talk to leaders about, you know, what do you need to do to have greater success with AI and analytics to overcome that hurdle we talked about at the start. Um, and so that just came out in December of this year um, and hopefully is, uh, you know, something that people could find as another resource. Um, but we thought we might start today's discussion with a little bit of a poll just to understand where people are at. And so are we ready for that, Jess? 
yeah, let's do it. I think it's up. Okay. So you'll see a poll up on the screen. If you can just click on, um, you know, your, how you would respond to our poll question. All right, let's give it maybe five more seconds. That sounds great. And, um, you know, just a, a little bit of a background on the book that Florian and I came out with. It's, you know, it's a book that's really intended to not turn you into a data scientist, but to make you more effective as a leader in dealing with data science. So I'll say more about that um, throughout today's talk. Um, I think we're ready to start sharing out the results. So I'll let Jess, maybe you can summarize what are we seeing? You know, I think it's really looking like pockets of usage and just getting started are where the majority of our attendees are. Does this surprise you? No, this is, you know, this is pretty common. I think, you know, when we have asked this question to different audiences, I would say that typically anywhere from, you know, 60 to 80% of the answers are in pockets of usage, just getting started or not getting, not being used at all. Right, so and this is pretty consistent with that. You know, it's about 19% of the top two boxes, and then, you know, 81% in the bottom three. And I think that's indicative that it's you know getting started with AI and analytics is a bit of a challenge, and we're just the, at the beginning of this journey. Um, and it's pretty common for all of us to be just trying to figure out, you know, how do I get started? What do I do? To sort of help with this, one of the things that we found is you is pretty helpful is actually to uh, think about a framework for analytics. And I'm gonna talk about this next. Um, in the meantime, I think we've shared the results out with everybody. Is that correct? Yeah. All right. And then I'm gonna uh, stop that sharing in just a second here, just so we can take, take down a little bit of screen space for people. Um, so what I would like to do is like sort of uh, show you the framework that we've developed. And I'm not gonna go through in detail what the framework is, but I just pause and ask you that you know, one of the big challenges inside companies today is that you have processes for nearly everything. You have a process for doing you know, financial reporting, for managing supply chain, for dealing with marketing. But if you go back and ask yourself, do we have a well-established uh, you know, process for doing AI and analytics in the company? The answer in most places is no. Right? We, we try to do this, but it's sort of in a one-off project basis. We really don't have an established process for how we do AI and analytics and how we actually integrate it with the rest of the business. So one of the things that business leaders need to focus on is how do you develop that process? The second thing that our framework tries to highlight is that there is a lack of consistent language amongst leaders around AI and analytics, and it really limits your ability to have success. So I'm not gonna go deep into the language that's on the slide today, but what I wanted to just point out is that one of the things you need as a leader is you need to start thinking about how do I get that process in my organization? How do I turn AI and analytics not into a one-off activity, but into a process? And how do I actually develop a language that works for us? So I don't think there's one answer as to what the ideal process is or one answer in terms of what the ideal language is, but you need to work on both, right? The other thing you need to start thinking about if you're going to have success with AI and analytics is to start thinking about, well, what is the art of the possible? Like, what can we do differently that we're not thinking about today? And so I wanted to share an example with you that I think is sort of inspiring and sort of gets you thinking about, oh, what can I do in my own business? What are some things that I could do with AI and analytics that I couldn't do before? So this example comes from a company that sells HVAC equipment, right? It's a commercial company doing B2B transactions. And this is a picture of a giant convention center. And so what they did is they worked with the convention center to collect all of the IOT data that's coming off of their equipment. So they have these massive things like chillers that they install to provide air conditioning for the convention center, but it's throwing off tons and tons of data. And what they did is they started using that data and combining it with AI models and they determined the best way to operate the convention center to provide sort of the ideal humidity, the ideal temperature. And it's a complicated problem because you've got tens of thousands of people moving in and out of spaces. Uh, so you have to understand the flow of traffic. You have to understand you know, current conditions inside and outside the building. But they used AI and analytics to uh, better operate their convention center. And that in itself is saying, oh, that's interesting. I'm operating my convention center be better, right? But What's the art of the possible here? The art of the possible for if you're selling HVAC equipment is to start asking, well, why are we in the business of selling hardware? Why aren't we selling outcomes? Why aren't we selling the temperature? Why are we selling a guarantee about the humidity? Why don't we guarantee 
you know, what it's going to be like in the environment, because that's what you want as a customer. If I put my marketing hat on, you know, I don't care that I bought a chiller. I wanted to make sure that it provides air conditioning. I want to make sure that it provides the right humidity. And so now what you start thinking about is, you know, how do we transform our business from just selling hardware into selling services as well? And what does that all mean? And the services themselves, what are they enabled by? They're enabled by AI, machine learning, and all of the data that we're collecting. And so you start you have to start sort of shifting your entire mindset away from, you know, we're building machines, in this case, chillers that last 20 years. And we talk to our customers, you know, once every 20 years when they need a new chiller versus we're in there every day talking to them about, you know, is it working correctly? Is this the humidity level you like? Is this the temperature you like? And it changes your entire business model from start to finish. So I think this is a great example of sort of opening you up to sort of the art of the possible. And having success is about thinking about big ideas and trying to think about what could you do differently in your organization. So I think that's a nice like, sort of launching point for our discussion today. A second thing I wanted to point out is that you have to think a little bit more broadly about your business. And all of us, you know, doesn't matter where you're at, I'm in a marketing department, so I tend to think about marketing problems. All of us tend to think about the silo where we primarily focus and we don't have a broad lens. Enterprises have lots of things going on, right? And so you often don't look across the enterprise or you don't look across other industries within your sector, right? We tend to look at narrow, narrow silos. So if I work at a candy company, I only look at candy sales. I don't look at what's happening in detergent, right? I look at very narrow things because that's what I'm focused on. And I think the possibilities that come from broadening your lens and thinking about what else could be out there is really what's interesting because now with AI, machine learning and all of these technologies, we can handle massive amounts of data, right? But you still have to think about, well, what is the interesting question to ask? What's an interesting provocative question that might be a game changer for my industry? So I wanted to share with you just three examples of that that are actually part of my research to get you thinking about sort of, you know, some things with, that might be sort of different. And you'll notice that all of them were not possible unless we started thinking about this broad aperture of bringing together things that you normally wouldn't be thinking about. So data sets you wouldn't necessarily put together, you start thinking about them more broadly. So let me show you the first of these, which we published a few years ago. It was a, it was a paper we called Harbingers of Failure, right? And you remember this article well, Jess, remember the uh, Insight article you wrote about this for us. It's in our archives. <laughs> it's in our archives. Yeah. So, so uh, this is a, a great article where we ask this question of, you know, are there customers who reliably buy products that tend to fail in a store? All right. So an infamous failure for Oreo is things like watermelon flavored Oreo. Right. You know, just in, you know, you have to ask yourself, how did this ever get launched? It like, why would even look good? <laughs> no. <laughs> Can you imagine like bringing this home to your kids today, Jess, and like telling them I just bought some watermelon Oreos? Well, my kids are maybe not the, <laughs> not the target like market. <laughs> so what, what's interesting about this is if you look at most papers written in academia, they're written about things like, you know, people buying yogurt, people buying detergent, people buying ketchup. But what's shocking is while we have access to an entire grocery store and we have access to all of these customer buying items across lots and lots of categories, we then narrow our focus down to, oh, what did you do in the soda category? Because I want to study Coke versus Pepsi. Or what did you do in the detergent category? Because I want to study Tide detergent. Almost no studies look at the entire store. Almost no studies look at everything you buy. So here we do exactly that. We look at everything you buy and we ask, you know, Jess, you bought something, you know, maybe you're a harbinger of success. Maybe you're the person who buys products who succeed and I'm the harbinger of failure. I tend to buy those products that, you know what, I bought them and, you know, they're likely to fail. And what this paper shows is that if you reliably buy things that fail, you're going to do so again in the future. Meaning that if you're the kind of a person that bought watermelon Oreos, you know, another product you buy is also likely to be a failure. So you're this bellwether, not of success, but of failure. So you're this bellwether customer that helps sort of predict, you know, is this product going to succeed? And why is this so important? Because predicting new product success is incredibly difficult for most firms, right? The failure rate of new products is incredibly high. It's hard to know, is a product going to succeed or is it going to fail? And what's curious about this is notice that purchases are normally viewed as a positive signal, not a negative signal. So the fact that you bought something, Jess, is going to sort of say, you know what, that product's likely to succeed. Other people might want to buy it. 
right? But what we show is exactly the opposite. Positive signals are actually negative, meaning that you bought something and it's actually a negative signal that the product is actually gonna fail, which is curious, right? So that was some of the early work we did. And then we said, you know what? Why don't we keep looking at problems like this? And so we started looking at sort of, let's turn this entire problem on its head and ask the following question. You know, are there certain categories that people buy in the store that are predictive that the customer is going to leave? So remember in the last project, we're looking at is the product going to fail? So is watermelon Oreos going to make it or not? Is it going to succeed? Now we're going to ask almost the opposite question, which is, you know, Eric walks into this store. He buys items from these categories. Are the categories that he's buying from, are those categories predictive that he might actually leave, that he might actually depart the store in the future. And it turns out that purchases from certain categories are highly indicative that you are likely to leave, that you're likely to disappear from the store. And you might sort of be asking yourself, you know, well, how does this happen? Like what's going on in the background? So we did some digging into this. And uh, so one of the things that's going on is that most stores or many stores don't carry the full assortment. Right? They don't carry everything that's possible in the market. They have to focus, right? So all we teach in marketing is things like segmentation, targeting, positioning, like be focused. Don't sell everything to everybody. Try and identify a position in the market. Well, what does that translate into? Assortments often aren't really broad. So if you go into a place like Aldi, Aldi's famous for, you know, how many ketchups do they offer? One. You don't get a broad assortment of ketchups to choose from. They have a very narrow assortment. Costco, what do they focus on? Large sizes, but also a limited number of varieties. They may only have like one type of olive oil or two types of olive oil. They have limited assortments and they don't offer small packages, right? And so what we show is that customers coming in and buying from certain categories actually will end up leaving when they buy in certain categories. And the reason is because they, they discover that they value that assortment elsewhere. They wanna have items that you don't carry today. Right? Mm. And what they find themselves in is they're buying from you today because they're somewhat locked in. So they show up at your store, right? They you know, don't want to go elsewhere to get that item. And so they're willing to sacrifice on the margin to maybe get their less favorite brand today. But now when they're outside your store and they're thinking about where they want to shop and they have choices, they don't come back again because they realize you don't carry their favorite brands. Right? And so we show that's exactly what happens. And if you reflect on your own purchase behavior, we often see you doing, people doing this where you still make a purchase even though you didn't want to, but you really don't wanna go travel and make a second trip to the store to get that cereal or that soda or that juice that you want. And you'll go back to your favorite place in the future. And so again, how did we land on this? We landed on this by taking this broad aperture, looking at lots of data, not just a narrow silo of data. The third project I wanted to share with you comes from uh, sort of the credit card industry. So this is a cool project that my current PhD student is working on with me along with another student that just graduated. And what we came across is a company that actually offers a credit card and has all of the credit card data you would normally get if you were a credit card issuer, like you know a Citibank or you know Chase or whoever's offering a credit card. So they have tons and tons of credit card data. We get all of the typical credit card data, like you know your demographic information. So I know your age and your income. I know your credit score. I know your bill payment history. So I know you know how, what was your bill and did you pay? But on top of that, we now sort of broaden the lens and say, well, what else do they own? Well, this company that owns the credit card also owns a grocery store and a really large grocery store, but attracts lots and lots of customers. And so what we did is we said, well, wouldn't it be interesting to ask, is there any relationship to your behavior in paying your credit card bill, but also paying, or also buying groceries, okay? And so you might say, well, how could those two things be related? Well, one of the most common things that happens in credit cards is we all know that we wanna be good customers, pay our bills on time, but have you ever occasionally missed a bill, Jess? Like you just occasionally forgot to pay a bill for a credit card or some other bill? Yep. Yep. It happens to all of us and you feel terrible. And then immediately what happens is there's late fees and there's all sorts of charges that come with this, right? And so we started asking like, well, who are the kinds of customers that never miss a credit card payment? And who are the kinds of customers that are what they call sloppy payers? Meaning that they just, they forgot to pay their March bill, but they make it up in April, right? Mm -hmm. So they don't go delinquent. They pay it, they keep paying their credit card bill off, but they miss a payment. Well, 
we use your grocery store data and saying, well, what might be a characteristics of, of somebody that you know might be in our grocery data? So we look at, do you always shop the same day of the week? Like, so people who are pretty routine based would say like, you know, I always shop on Saturdays. I always go on Sunday, right? Well, it turns out if you are more routine based and you tend to shop on the same day versus you shop on a variety of days, if you shop on lots of different days, you're more likely to miss a credit card payment, right? And why? Perhaps because you don't have strong routines. Well, what's another measure of routines? Do you pay a similar amount every month? Or sorry, in, in your, do you buy a similar amount of groceries on every visit? So if on one grocery trip, you spend $250 and then on the next trip you spend 25, there's a lot of variability. But people with a plan come in and they say, nope, I'm gonna spend between 90 and $110. That's my routine. And they hit that number all the time. And guess what? They never miss their credit card payments, right? Mm -hmm. The people who have lots of variability in their spend, they miss credit card payments, right? What else do they do? Well, if you always buy the same brand, what does that mean? You know, you've determined like, Hunts is my favorite brand of ketchup or Heinz is my favorite brand of ketchup. And I have specific preferences and I don't try sort of random stuff. Well, people who seek variety and try lots of stuff, they miss their credit card payments. So people who are more routine based and always buy the same brands and just are religious about coming the same day of the week, spending the same amount, buying the same brands also tend not to miss their credit card payment. And then the last cool thing we find is what do these guys who miss credit card payments also miss out on? they miss out on all the deals. So they're more likely to miss deep discounts that are offered because they don't notice them. They're not good shoppers, right? So they're not as financially savvy in terms of like looking for deals that are happening. People that pay their car credit card bill on time, what do they do? They tend to find more deals. And so all of this seems consistent with this idea that as a customer, what are you doing? Your behaviors in the grocery store translate to a completely different domain of paying credit card bills. And so this has all sorts of interesting implications. The only way you could get there is by having this broad aperture and trying to think about the world a little bit differently instead of through this narrow silo of what's happening in the credit card business, what's happening in you know, the soda business. Let's think more broadly because these are customers. It's the same customer shopping in grocery as is shopping in uh, you know, is paying your credit card bills. And I think that's why it's super interesting. So hopefully that gives you just three quick snippets of research. Um, maybe this is actually a pretty good point in our webinar to have a little bit of a transition. Um, did you want to take a few questions now, Jess? Uh, do yeah, a poll? I, I, I'd love to. Um, so I think there's a really big uh, chicken and egg question out there that I think a lot of people probably have. So it's very clear that all of these insights into your customers could be very, very useful as you think about designing products, maybe changing the entire customer experience. Um, how do you come up with these, these ideas? Is, is it kind of like you, you have a bunch of data and you say, let's go figure out what's in here? Or do you need to kind of have that research question top of mind? You have to kind of already have a hypothesis that your customers might be doing this and then kind of work backward to then answer the question. Yeah, I think it's a, that's a great insightful question. I really love that question because there is this perception out there that you know if I get all of this data and I get this super sophisticated model and I hire some really smart data scientists, I'll be able to uncover all the insights that Eric just talked about, right? That I can do that too. And the answer is not quite. You need to be thinking just like you always have, right? Of being super creative, right? And so the idea of looking at things in different ways, I think is always gonna be out there. I think it, it would just be impossible to say that you would land on this without a bit of a plan without a bit of an idea that I think there's an opportunity to look at the world in a different way. And I think that's sometimes lost in the world that we're in today where people say, no, if I just get all this data, magic is gonna happen. You also have to be creative. You have to think about, you know, what are some creative ideas? We didn't land on those ideas that I just described by chance. As you said, Jess, we had a, we had a hypothesis, right? So we had some guesses and then we confirmed them through our analysis. So. I think that you know what we what we need going forward is to keep in mind like managers still play a role because you understand customers you understand the business you understand the way the world works these models are enablers right they're not a, a pure substitute they can help you uncover new insights but you have to guide them you have to lead them down this path you're a bit of their sherpa 
you know, helping them to find those cool insights because um, they may not find them on their own. We had another pretty interesting question come in. Uh, why do you need a process for AI in a company versus just thinking about it as a tool that you might deploy in one very narrow situation? Oh, very good question. So um, if you think of it as a tool that you just deploy, what tends to happen is, A, you don't get a lot of scale, right? So if you're just going to do it as a one-off project, right? Mm -hmm. If you, that was, it, I'll just take that as the first interpretation, like, oh, I'm just going to do this in a one-off case. Uh, you don't get much, much of an impact from that. The second is now you say, well, no, I want to turn into a system. I want to do this regularly. I want to do this over and over again. If you're working in a world where everything was already automated and already sort of digital, then that transformation from you know, using an old system to an AI system may not be that big. But where most people run into a challenge is that this thing we're going to call AI has you know, people involved. Right? It interfaces with other processes that involve humans and involve different kinds of data. And so you have to take this, call it this product and this system you're going to build and inject it into a business that has many other complicated processes. And that requires everything to work in sync. That's why you need processes to connect with other processes inside the business, right? And where it often fails is you don't have that process-based view. You're not thinking about this as a system that connects with other systems. And then the whole thing starts to fall apart, right? Because you start to say, oh, well, I need engineers who are going to use this system or I need decision makers who are going to use the system. Well, how did they make decisions today? And how do they interact with others who make decisions? It's that interconnection of this I'll call it a spider web of complex, pro complex processes that leads to a lot of failure because we don't get that integration. We don't get that integration of processes. Uh, all right, we just got a, a good one that just came in. Um, it sounds like the analysis system that you're describing requires non-siloed data. Um, how can you as a marketing or a different business leader uh, sell others in your organization on the value of making the data flexible? Ooh, that's a great question. I, I, I think that um, it is a bit of a selling problem, but I think it's also a roles and responsibilities problem. And so uh, it comes back to this question of, you know, a lot of enterprises, you know, shockingly don't have somebody uh, that has a title of maybe like master data management, or they don't have a master data management strategy, or it's at their infancy. So we've talked to numerous companies that either didn't have that or are just launching it and starting to stabilize it. But that what that gives you is this enterprise-wide view of everything you have and the ability to integrate things across the organization. A consistent view of what do terms mean, meaning we don't define metrics differently across different parts of the organization. Everybody has access to the information. We don't hold it in pockets and in silos where we protect our own data. And getting to that stage for a lot of companies is quite difficult, right? So I think it's, you know, it's not just convincing people, it's actually bringing on new talent and systems that support this view of, we take an enterprise-wide view of things rather than a siloed view of things. And that requires people transformation, cultural transformation, new systems. It's not a simple, oh, just go do this. It's, a, it's actually a fairly complicated process. Well, I think that's going to bring us to kind of the how do you do this part. So uh, do you want to kick off that poll? Sure. Why don't we launch our next poll? So what we want to ask you is thinking about your current situation, what's preventing you from getting the most out of AI? Um, my organization needs to adapt. I need to adapt as a leader or both of us need to adapt. I'm seeing a lot of shared culpability here. <laughs> I'm seeing the same thing, Jess. <laughs> yeah, and I think the reason we ask this question is that, you know, the, the journey we are on is one of massive transformation. And it's really a huge change management exercise. Um, so there's a lot of change management in store. And I think that's really, um, you know, the challenge. I think we've reached a pretty good point on responses. Maybe we can end the poll and share things out. Excellent. So you can see that, you know, uh, as you were saying, just 72% uh, of the people said both of us need to adapt. And, you know, we hear that across the board when we talk to companies that it's both the organization needing to change, leaders needing to change, and 
um, everything having to change. And even if you think you're skilled up as a leader, and we're, we've talked to numerous people in this field, um, and you think you know a lot about data science, I think what, what often doesn't happen is that experts in the field who are experts in data science actually need to become a little bit more broad and a little less dogmatic about the way they view the world to have success. And I think the reason that's so challenging is that data science as a field is incredibly specialized, right? It's an area where, you know, you might know a lot about natural language processing, or you might know a lot about, you know, uh, building deep uh, learning models or neural networks. But, you know, what you also have to have an appreciation of is like the broad spectrum. And that requires everybody to sort of adapt, even those people that are leaders and experts in data science. So what I wanted to share with you, uh, just as sort of in the second half of what we're going to talk about today, was you know a little bit about the journey you might be on personally and how we might adapt at, um, both personally and professionally. And so when we think about this change management exercise, um, you know one of the things to think about is you know what do I need to do personally in terms of becoming better at data science or knowing more about it. And so. Um, what we tend to think of is this, we use this phrase, my colleague Florian Zettelmeyer and I use this phrase, that business leaders need what's called a working knowledge of data science. So a working knowledge of data science. This does not mean that you're a data scientist, right? Data science is very specialized. It requires lots of knowledge about, you know, algorithms or statistics uh, inside the world of, you know, data engineering or systems engineering. It's also very uh, technically savvy. So what you need as a business leader is to have this working knowledge. And when you have this, what we think you have is the intuition. You know enough to talk to everybody, to sit through meetings, to make decisions. You couldn't build an algorithm yourself. You couldn't launch a neural network. You couldn't do a data engineering project. But you know enough to make decisions and to lead in that environment. And when you get to this level where you have enough intuition about how the data science actually works at an intuitive level, we think it gives you a number of things. The first is that it allows you to judge what good AI and analytics actually looks like, right? And there is bad AI and analytics applied and there's good AI and analytics. And you wanna know what good looks like. The second thing is that you've got a number of priorities inside your business. And you really wanna be able to step back and ask yourself, you know, where are the problems that AI and analytics can create the most value? Not that they could create value, but where are my highest priorities? Right? And that ability to prioritize only comes when you know enough about the science. You've got to know a little bit about how the science works to know, is it appropriate for my organization? The third thing is to know what questions should I ask to ensure that I will have success with AI and analytics-based decision-making. So one of the things you have to be really good at as a leader is to start learning how to probe those around you and ask really well-informed questions, right? To understand like, you know, do we have the resources to succeed here? Tell me more about how this is going to lead to an impact in my organization, right? Tell me how this AI and analytics you're proposing is deeply connected to my strategic priorities and is going to deliver on those priorities. You have to have the confidence to ask those probing questions. And the fourth thing comes back to my HVAC example is that you really couldn't talk about turning your business into a service organization in that example and thinking about ripping apart your entire business until you knew a little bit about what was going on in the science. Now you don't need to know the exact algorithm that was used to run the HVAC equipment inside the convention center, but you sure as heck should know a little bit about what's going on in the background in terms of the data that's being collected and a rough idea of how that data is being used to formulate advice to improve the operations of the convention center. And then the last thing is, which is really critical for leaders, is to understand how to make the appropriate investments in people, in culture, in organizational structure, and in data and systems that allow you to scale analytics and AI. And you don't have an infinite amount of money. You've got to make the right investments in those four buckets. And so understanding how to do that is critical for success. But you really can't make the right investment decisions until you know a little bit more about the science, right? And so we always like to joke that, you know, you can be a senior leader, you know, you might be the CEO of a company and somebody would say, you know, do you need to know a little bit about finance, right? And, you know, the answer is, of course, you better know a heck of a lot about finance if you're going to be the CEO of a company. You would never be caught saying, you know, I don't know anything about finance, but I've got this really smart CFO that knows everything about finance. So any questions about finance, just go ask the CFO. No senior leader would do this. I think you're going to see this 
go on with analytics, particularly in the top of the house with senior leaders. You need to know enough about this to manage the business and to make these investment decisions, right? And so to do this, you need this working knowledge of data science. So that's sort of our first point. Um, did that make sense, Jess? Yeah, yeah. Perfect. The second thing we like to talk about is, you know, it's not just important for business leaders to get better, uh, but you know, it's really important for data scientists to understand how to communicate and work with business leaders who are not technical experts. So if you're thinking about your own self as a data scientist, or you think about your organization where you're surrounded by a lot of data scientists, that communication is absolutely critical, right? And so to set the stage for this, you know, my colleague, uh, Matt Denisuk, who's at Royal Caribbean, likes to use this phrase, mature AI. You know, and most data scientists are trained in what we think of as mature AI, because this is the kind of AI we teach, you know, in a controlled, ideal uh, university setting, right? So I can train a PhD student or a master's student, you know, about how would you actually do image recognition, right? So how would you recognize pictures of people or pictures of cats, right? How would you do that, right? But we do it in a very stylized, sterile way where, you know, there are typically no managers for a data science to interact with. The data is perfect. Uh, there are no real world complexities. But to enable what we think of as mature AI, which is AI in the real world, all of these issues come to life, right? And to deal with them, to deal with you know, people and messy data and complex processes requires meetings and discussions, right? And at the heart of this is communication, right? And so data scientists need to become much better at communication with non-technical experts to overcome some of these hurdles because launching AI in a company, in a real world production environment, in a functioning business is very, very different than establishing proof of concept in a, in a you know, laboratory or in a university where you can say, hey, we can do it. I can recognize people. I can predict customer churn. Getting that embedded into a, into a company requires the business leaders and the data scientists to have much better collaboration and much better cooperation. And that sort of dovetails with my third point, which is that when we start thinking about what really is critical here, you know, if you're going to have success and overcome some of these hurdles with having success with AI and analytics, collaboration is central. And so at the heart of collaboration, if I come back to my framework, right, is I illustrated this, this AI and analytics framework early on in the, in the webinar today. And what you start to think about is, it, well, what language do we have for talking about it? Everyone likes to say AI, but what else do you, what other phrases do you use? And what exactly does AI mean at our company? Like a very simple example of this is the word experiment. So if you ask a social scientist that does, you know, experimentation all the time, you know, tell me what an experiment is they would tell you, oh, it's an A-B test, or it's what's known as a randomized control trial. But what are we doing? We're taking a large population of, of people, perhaps, say like 100,000 people. We randomly allocate 50,000 to the test group, 50,000 to the control group, right? Or we might do a randomized control trial in healthcare, like we saw happening over the last year in COVID. What did they do? They bring in a bunch of participants. They randomly assign some to the actual you know, vaccination and some to a placebo, and then they see what happens, right? That's an experiment to a social scientist. Now you go interview a computer scientist and you're talking to someone you just hired as a computer scientist and you say, you know, can you tell me about an experiment you recently conducted? And they'll tell you, great, I can tell you all about this experiment and they start describing it. Well, to a computer scientist though, what an experiment means is a scenario. So if you're thinking about an Excel spreadsheet, you know, it would be like saying, let me take this set of rows of data and describe you what happens in those rows. Like, What's the average churn rate if, for a telecom company of customers who are in these rows of data, right? And so an experiment to a computer scientist is not an A-B test where we randomly uh, send things to a test group and a control group. An experiment is, you know, what would happen if we just looked at this slice of data or this chunk of data or this particular scenario, right? And so we have very different uses. There's nothing wrong with doing that. It's actually a perfectly fine thing to do, but it has a completely different meaning. And so I'll, I often joke, because the first time I discovered this, I was talking to a computer scientist. They said, you know, do you run experiments? They said, yeah, we've got like, you know, over a billion experiments in our data. And I'm like, how, how did you ever run a billion A-B tests? Like, because we think of this as there's a billion combinations in my data. There's a billion scenarios in my data, right? And so you can immediately see where you, this runs into some challenges. It can run into challenges at a company at hiring. 
you know, your job description says you have to be an expert in experiments. Talk to computer scientists. I'm an expert in experiments. I know all about this. I know how to do scenario analysis. Well, do you want scenario analysis or do you want A-B testing, right? It can lead to a lot of confusion. And so organizations have to recognize this and establish their own vocabulary, their own way of talking about things. So common language, I think, is absolutely critical for having success. Second thing people need to think about is we've talked about having frameworks and processes. We had a question about that earlier. Um, you need to start thinking about how you're gonna actually establish a framework and a process inside your company, right? And so when you go into a company, right, what do you typically find? They have numerous processes for marketing, operation, and finance. And then ask yourself, do you have a process for establishing how you're gonna do AI and analytics inside your company? If you don't do this, what often happens is you think you're doing science and you end up not, right? And so one of the uh, examples we like to give of this is that we, what you often have to do is connect the science to the business, right? So imagine I'm a telecom company and I'm interested in managing customer churn, right? And so data scientist says, great, I can help you manage customer churn. You know, I can build a model to predict customer churn. I can tell you what factors are affecting churn. And I can even maybe tell you how to influence what's happening with churn. But if you go up to a higher level in the company and you move beyond, say, a manager who's directed with managing churn, you might say, well, what do you care about? Do you care about profitability? Do you care about market share? What are your goals here? Right? What are the overall business goals? And what that forces you to think about is, well, I can build a model that measures customer churn, helps me manage customer churn, but the business cares about things like gross margin. They care about market share. They care about profitability. So how are you gonna connect those two worlds? And the connection happens through processes and frameworks. You have to have a process to connect analytics and AI with the business outcomes you care about. So imagine you didn't. Imagine you didn't connect them. What ends up happening is that you end up coming back and you're saying, oh, give us this model, right? That predicts customer churn and we'll figure out what to do as business leaders. And at this point, you can basically do whatever you want. You can prove, you know, things that will maximize market share or profitability. You're sort of peeking at the answers. And a well-designed system has a process that says, no, we're gonna have a way of going from analytics to business decision in a very structured way. And most companies don't have that structure. And it really limits your ability to do science by not having those processes. And then the last thing I wanted to point out was, you know, what does all this mean for companies? What it really points out is that what you need are what we think of as new ways of working, right? That what companies really need is a new way of thinking about doing business. And so language, framework, and processes are really about, you know, you thinking about new ways of working, right? And that's what's really critical for companies going forward. So we think about, you know, our framework that's out there, you know, it's a way of telling people, you know, here's a way of organizing your thoughts of going from a business objective all the way through to making a business decision and scaling things over time. But what I thought we could end with today, Jess, is just a little bit of uh, Q&A and just talk a little bit about, you know, what are, is on, are on people's minds um, and wrap up our discussion for the last 15 minutes with questions from the audience. So let me uh, end on my last slide here and then we can... Uh, share things out. That sounds great because we have a grab bag for you. I hope you are ready. All right, let's go for it. All right. Um, I actually want to start since you made such a great point for the importance of common language. I wanted to start with just a seemingly simple question um, that I imagine is actually more complicated than that. How do you differentiate analytics from AI? Does it matter? Great question. Uh, so I'll give you the, I'll try and give you the very short answer. So what is AI? It's artificial intelligence. And so then you have to ask yourself, okay, what is intelligence? And intelligence is really about developing knowledge, right? So knowledge about various things in our environment. And once you have that, you can take actions. You can do all sorts of different things. And that's speaking just very generally as a human, you develop some knowledge and then you can make decisions. How do you get to that knowledge? Well, you have learning, right? So you've learned something and then learning generalizes into knowledge. And how do we learn? We interface as humans with everyone around us. So we have inputs, we have outputs, and we can call all that data. And so there's this process of going from data to learning to knowledge, which is what AI is really trying to do. It's trying to take all of this data, say sensor data from cars, like the Google car driving example, turn that into learning, right? And then turn it into knowledge, right? 
And you know, that's what intelligence is all about. So then just step back from that and say, what's happening with AI? There's algorithms that are trying to behave that way. What's analytics then? Analytics is fundamentally that same process. Analytics is about taking data, developing learnings or insights, and then transforming that into knowledge, right? It isn't any different. And so, you know, there's a, a lot of dogmatic views about, oh, AI is different or analytics is different, and they're actually quite related, right? There, there's a whole underpinning of this that says this process of going from data to learning to knowledge is the same for analytics as it is for AI. There are several things that are quite distinct though. AI is a little broader, right? In the sense that, you know, how would you put natural language processing into that framework? It's a little bit different. So AI is much bigger. It's got a bigger tent and a bigger umbrella. And then the second thing that's critical, I think with AI, and you'll notice it at the bottom of our framework is that AI often has this idea of scaling, of doing things over and over again and being sort of, you know, a system that can learn, a system that can adapt over time. And I think that's what makes it special. Analytics never really sort of had that flavor. It sort of stood as like a, a one-off project or maybe a system that was static. But AI is a little bit special in the sense that it's introduced these ideas of you know, reinforcement learning and evolving over time and not being static. Right? But I would say there's a lot more commonality than many people realize uh, between analytics and AI. Hopefully I, that wasn't too long. <laughs> no, this is great. This is why we're here. Um, we've gotten a lot of variations of a question that is basically, okay, where do we start? Do we hire a consultant? Do we start collecting gobs of data? Do we outsource our research? Um, and how does this answer differ depending on whether you're a very large company with a lot of resources at your disposal versus a much smaller company, maybe with a flat hierarchy where you've got a lot of people that wear a lot of hats? Yep. Uh so I'll start with maybe big companies because that's a little easier to talk about. Um, I think with a bigger company, you just have to get started and not assume everything's going to be perfect. So I'd say that in almost every big company we work with, there are pockets of analytics. And that actually came out in our quiz earlier. Remember, Jess, I think mm -hmm. most people said we've got pockets of analytics. Yep. Companies that have success stories, what do they do? They go to those pockets and they try and grow from within those pockets. Don't start over again. Leave them there. Don't mess up what's working. So rule number one of an established company, if you have a pocket of success, don't touch it, but keep it where it's at and keep it working, but try to make it grow, try to make it bigger, try to get it to stretch across other parts of the enterprise, right? The other thing when you say, you know, what should we do to get started? What's important in every organization is never start with data, never start with people, never start with systems or other things. What should you start with? Business priorities. You can't really get started at a company until you figure out what are the business problems we would like to solve. And I'll give you just a quick uh, example of this, which is that the, the types of data and the types of skills you need to solve certain problems are going to be different than other problems. So for example, suppose I, all I care about is predicting things in the future. So I want to predict, does a wind turbine fail? I want to predict, is a customer going to walk into my store? I want to predict, does do assets flow into a financial fund? Those are very clear predictive analytics problems. If that's all you care about as a leader, who do you want to hire? You want to hire people who are experts at predictive analytics. And that involves people who are maybe computer scientists that are strong in statistics, right? But they're really good at predicting things. It's a very specialized skill. Then suppose you say, no, no, that's not what I'm interested in, Eric. I want to improve my business. I want to do a better job at you know, marketing so that customers don't leave. I want to use marketing as a tool to prevent customers from leaving. I want to do a better job of influencing people's behavior. I want to do a better job of selling, right? So I want to help support my sales force and come up with best practices in selling. I'm not trying to predict things. I want to use these tools to influence my business and develop better business processes. Now you're in the world of saying what I want is I want to hire data scientists who are more social scientists. These would be people who are economists or sociologists or political scientists. They're trained in how do you run an A-B test. They're trained in how do you run quasi-experiments and they're trained in a very different domain. And so notice that right away, right, you have to be careful about this because these are two very different things and you've got to get it right, right? And so if you start with problems, you can identify what your needs are and hire it gets them. But if you don't start with problems, you run into all sorts of people. You just problems because you just start hiring people and say, great, let's just start hiring data scientists. I've got lots of smart people. 
and then your people aren't aligned with your problems. And you run into this, we see this happening over and over again. You hire a bunch of people that are computer scientists, they're gonna go build predictive models. But if you wanna you know, do causal modeling or you wanna do things that are gonna influence your business, they're not very good at it. And you're gonna run into this roadblock over and over again. I'm not going to let, uh, let you totally off the hook. We also asked about very small companies. Is AI totally out of reach for small companies where you know, it might be six people and they're all doing tons of different things? No, in fact, uh, everything is in such a world now where you can use cloud-based both data storage and computing that you know, the resources on the data and system side you know, are now available to everybody, which has made it fantastic. Um, the challenge for a lot of firms that are smaller, you know, do I have the people, right? Where do I find the people? Where do I find the skills to do some of these sophisticated things? That's where you might need to get started by saying, you know, maybe I can hire somebody who is you know, a consultant to help me out, or maybe I can hire somebody who's you know, a younger, less expensive person that just came out of a master's program to help me out. Right. So you're going to have to hire some talent. Right. But mm -hmm. before you hire the talent, figure out what problem you want them to solve. A big mistake is just to say, oh, let me hire somebody and say, help me figure something out. Help me use this to enable my business. I've got all this cool data. Can you find something there for me? You've got to be very specific and focused on what problems you'd like to solve. And presumably there are training opportunities for existing employees as well. Yeah, there's great resources. Um, I think we'll give you some at the end of the talk today on things you can go pursue, but the online training for the data science part of it is so democratized now uh, that it's great. So there's all sorts of online resources that we can give you access to uh, or direct you to um, that are great for training. We use them at Kellogg and you know they're fantastic resources for just, if you wanna get skilled up, uh, it's, it's not impossible to do today. So we have a uh, very popular question here. Any good examples of AI use in B2B companies? Oh yeah, yeah. So I'd say, you know, uh, enabling B2B sales funnel with AI is a huge topic right now. So you can imagine all the big tech firms, right? Whether you're talking about Google or Facebook or Microsoft, they're all worried about these issues, right? About how can we enable our sales force to work smarter using AI and machine learning models. And so they're giving it, you know, they're using all the data that's sitting inside the marketing funnel and along with experimentation to come back and make recommendations on how do we become more productive, right? And so all the big tech firms, that's a high priority item is like, you know, enabling your sales force to become better with AI and machine learning. Uh, so there's lots of opportunities in B2B and, and the challenge is really about, you know, trying to narrow your focus. Like another great example of where B2B is taking off is IOT, right? So there's like sensor data everywhere. And so if you want to run a manufacturing plant more effectively, right? Huge opportunities for AI because you can figure out, you know, how do you collect all that data and become more effective? And then that dovetails to our conversation about, oh, and that enables new opportunities of selling services rather than products. So I think it's the access to all sorts of interesting data, right? And in, in whether it's the marketing funnel, whether it's IOT data, I think if you're in B2B and looking for opportunity, it's all gonna be fueled about looking for interesting data sources that might help you come up with, you know, applications like the, I just described. IOT, what, what's that? Uh, Internet of Things. Ah, okay, okay. <laughs> that phrase has gotten an acronym now. <laughs> it has, a, yes, all the sensor data that's coming off of machines. So yeah, it is IoT data. Oh. And you experience it all the time, every day. Um, this is a stumper. I'm really curious what you're gonna say. Uh, do you see any industries or types of organizations that you think are really ripe for transformation if they actually invested more in AI? Um, yeah, I think, I mean, lots of, lots of places are ripe for transformation. I mean, we can point to ourselves. Academia is ripe for transformation. We're very, you know, academia operates, I always like to say, we're like a a giant oil tanker or an aircraft carrier, you know, we turn like three degrees to the left and we think that's a big deal. Um, we, we're pretty stodgy to change. And so I think there's lots of opportunities to use AI and machine learning in academia itself. So I would point to our own industry um, where I hope we see lots of advances uh, personally is affecting all of us today, which is healthcare, 
Mm. Um, and there's so much opportunity in healthcare because of the massive amount of data that's coming out. Um, but the reason it's so challenging it, compared to say doing this at a tech company is that it requires integration of people and complicated decisions and data to really make progress, right? So there are numerous people trying to think about this, faculty at Northwestern are thinking about this, but healthcare I think is a huge, huge opportunity that would help not only individuals, but society as a whole, and would be just a great thing for us to see, you know, healthcare take off in its use of AI. But it's, it's gonna be at the forefront of the challenges we talked about today because of the complexity of the system, the need to integrate these new tools into a very complicated environment that involves lots of different decision makers. Um, and that's what's really slowing down the advancement here. It's not that the science is slowing it down. It's actually much more about the business side of things and trying to get it all integrated. Um, we had a, a question about privacy. Um, I was wondering if you just had kind of thought about how organizations should be thinking about uh, customer privacy, other types of privacy concerns as they embark on, uh, you know, bolstering out their analytics capabilities. Yeah, I don't have the final word, obviously, on privacy, but I would, I would say that it's going to be an ongoing issue. We aren't going to ever stop talking about privacy and what's right about it. Um, I, I think the challenge is always, if I could tell you that I was going to use your data to help you out and make you better off and make everyone else better off, no one would have any issues, right? If I always had good intent, but it's very hard to manage intent to know intent and to you know, make that part of a, a, any sort of you know, policy. Um, what I would say is sort of interesting that I think is like things to think about is startups that are out there that are saying, you know what, Eric, you don't need to worry about that. We're going to have a startup where you can own all your data. And then companies that want access to it will come and talk to you. And you can then give them permission to use your data uh, for free. You could sell them your data uh, and you'll control access to your data. And we're not that far away from having that. So you would have full access to your own data. All of like all my digital data would be stored in the Eric Anderson world. And then companies would have to come say to me, do I wanna give you access to it? I would control the access to my own information. And I don't think that's actually a crazy idea. I think that's actually an interesting. And there's a couple of startups that are out there actually trying to do this right now um, where they've said, you know what, we can allow you to store your data and then we'll work with companies to try and come to you and say, we'd like to access your data. So. I think that starts to address some of these privacy issues, models like that, that are out there and could be a cool thing to keep an eye on in the future. All right. Um, I think unfortunately we are at time, um, but I wanna thank you so much for chatting with us. I wanna thank all of the people who have joined us today from around the world, sending in really great questions. Um, and uh, as a reminder, we, we did record this. I promise we will send out a link to a video of this entire presentation to everyone who registered. And don't forget about next month's discussion on business and activism. That webinar will be on Thursday, April 22nd at noon. And we really hope to see you then. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jess. Thanks, Eric.